In this PowerPoint, we are going to go into a lot of detail on specific parts of the development of the heart and circulation. So I want you to watch this short comprehensive video first. It will give you a little bit of an overview of what we'll be looking at. Remember that the heart forms very early in development. The heart begins to beat on day 21 or 22 and blood is circulating by about days 24 to 25. When you watch the video, pay special attention to the information about the foramen ovale and the ductus arteriosus. These are particularly important clinically as they relate to common congenital heart defects. Now that you have seen this overview video, let's go through some of the details about the development of the heart. Think back to the first general PowerPoint about the first weeks of embryonic development. Do you remember gastrulation when the mesoderm layer was produced from the endodermal primitive streak and primitive node? This is also when the cardiogenic mesoderm develops. This is the same time as the formation of the nodal cord. So now look at this picture at 18 days of development. The horseshoe shaped region is the cardiogenic region. Cardiac progenitor cells, or the cells that are going to form the heart, are derived from the mesoderm at the cranial part of the primitive streak. So on the last slide, we talked about the very beginnings of the heart itself. Now let's talk about how the blood vessels form. Vasculogenesis, or the initial formation of the very beginning blood vessels, also starts around the third week of development. As mesodermal cells start to differentiate into a hemangioblast and then into angioblasts. These cells eventually form blood islands, and these blood islands are mainly in the yolk sac external to the embryo. Vascular tubes start to develop on the blood islands in, in many regions at once, and they eventually join together. Eventually, these blood vessels in the yolk sac invade the embryo and fuse with a few blood vessels that are developing there. This process where new blood vessels develop from existing ones is called angiogenesis. A-N-G-I-O-G-E-N-E-S-I-S. -E -E and angiogenesis continues throughout life. And angiogenesis is important in wound healing. And understanding angiogenesis is also important for when you start to understand how benign tumors become malignant tumors. So formation of the blood cells themselves is called hematopoiesis. And it starts in the yolk sac. It starts in the yolk sac with the endothelium and then hematopoiesis moves to the liver at five months of gestational age, and eventually it moves to the spleen and the bone marrow. But remember, when the blood first starts to form, there aren't any bones yet. Remember, there's a lot of development going on in the embryo at the same time. Even within the cardiovascular system, the heart is developing, the vessels are developing, etc. But for the sake of explanation, let's get back to the primitive heart development. Two endocardial tubes develop in the cardiogenic region of the germ disc. Do you remember the first lectures when we talked about embryonic lateral folding? During embryonic folding, around day 19, the endocardial tubes fuse 
into a single heart tube. But look at these pictures and notice where the parts of the heart tube are located. The sinus venosus is the inflow end where the blood comes in. It has two horns. The right horn is going to become part of the right atrium and the left horn is going to become part of the coronary sinus. And the primitive atrium is right above that. Above the atrium is the primitive ventricle and with the bulbous cortis is above that. So in the primitive heart, the atria are at the bottom and the parts that are eventually going to become the ventricles, the bulbous cortis and the primitive ventricle are near the top. This is the opposite of how the adult heart is configured. So obviously, there's going to be some flipping and turning. Look carefully at this slide because it shows how the heart tube bends and folds. Remember, the heart begins to beat at day 22. And then on day 23, this bending and folding begins. The bulbous cortis moves down inferiorly and forward or anteriorly and to the embryo's right. The bulbous cortis forms most of the right ventricle and the outflow tracks. So now it's in position. The primitive atrium and sinus venosus move up or superiorly and back posteriorly. Give yourself a few minutes to review this slide. It's a summary of the early heart development showing the cardiogenic area, the two heart tubes fusing to one, the rotation and ultimate positioning of the heart. Note the days of embryonic development that this occurs. This is very early in development. Watch this video showing the early heart development and the folding of the primitive heart tube. This two minute video will help you synthesize your learning. Thank you to Indiana University for these wonderful videos. Up until about four weeks, the primitive heart is pumping, but the tube is not divided into left and right chambers. At about four weeks, endocardial cushions develop in the atrioventricular canal and on the bulbous cortis. These will eventually become the valves and the septa that divide the left and right parts of the heart. If these don't form correctly, babies are born with septal defects after birth. This picture shows how the primitive atrium is divided into two chambers by the thin septum primum and the thicker septum secundum. Both have openings initially. Eventually, this all develops into the foramen or valle. Initially, the heart is pumping, but it is not fully divided into left and right chambers. At about four weeks of embryonic development, endocardial cushions develop on the atrioventricular canal and on the bulbous cortis. These will eventually become the valves and the septa that divide the left and right parts of the heart. If the septa don't develop correctly, babies are born with septal defects after birth. And this is an important uh, type of congenital heart defect. This picture shows how the primitive atrium is divided into two chambers by the thin septum primum and the thicker septum secundum. Both have openings initially, and these form the foramen ovale and eventually the fossa ovalis. This is a long but important video, again from Indiana University. It shows the concept of blood shunting from one side of the heart to the other, and this is a very important concept for you to understand. 
in order to be able to understand fetal circulation and the congenital heart conditions. A patent or open foramen ovale, also called a PFO, is a common congenital heart defect. By the time the embryo becomes a fetus, the circulatory system is pretty well formed and is working well, making sure that all the body parts get the oxygen and nutrients that they need during the period of great fetal growth. Still, fetal circulation is different than the circulation after birth, and you'll want to know what is different. Remember that the fetus is getting all of its oxygen and nutrients from the mom in blood from the placenta. This oxygenated blood comes into the fetus through the umbilical vein. The deoxygenated blood goes away from the fetus and back to the placenta and goes back to the placenta and the mom through the umbilical artery. This can be a little bit confusing when you look at the picture because we're used to the concept of veins being blue and arteries being re red. Let's get back to the pathway from the umbilical vein. Some of the oxygenated blood goes to the liver, but most bypasses it by the ductus venosus and combines with blood from the distal parts of the fetus, which come in through the inferior vena cava. This all empties into the right atrium. And since pressure in the right atrium is higher than the left atrium, most blood will be shunted through the foramen ovale. Some blood goes on through to the right ventricle, but most goes to the aorta via the ductus arteriosus. What happens at birth to change the fetal circulation into the circulation of the baby? I'm going to read to you from a, a major pediatric physical therapy textbook. This is called Pediatric Physical Therapy and it's by Jan Teclin. At birth, several changes occur within the circulatory system. As the first breath is taken, the lungs expand with air and lung pressure falls. This allows blood to flow more easily into the lungs. After reaching the lungs, the blood returns to the left atrium, which causes pressure to be higher on the left of the atrial septum than on the right. This pressure differential and the increase in oxygen levels cause the foramen ovale, the ductus arteriosus, and the ductus venosus to functionally close shortly after birth. The foramen ovale closes anatomically by 9 to 30 months, and the ductus arteriosus by 2 to 3 months, and the ductus venosus closes by 7 to 14 days. The body now relies on the lungs for obtaining oxygen and expelling carbon dioxide and maintains separation of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood.